Hello, um, welcome to my first uh, recording of uh, lectures for principles of MRI, the UCSF Biomedical Imaging uh, 201 course. Um, my name is Peter Larson. I'm an associate professor of radiology and biomedical imaging at UCSF. Um, teaching this course, um, and I hope uh, this is my first video in the series here, so I hope uh, everyone enjoys this. Um, so I'm going to start off. Uh, this lecture is going to be covering chapter two of our textbook, which is this MRI the Basics, uh, the fourth version, following uh, basically along uh, with the text here. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to start and end also all of these lectures with a, a list of some some learning goals. So you know, um, you can, uh, the things that I uh, hope that you can uh, come out of the lecture understanding. Um, uh, there's a lot of things is the main point of this uh, slide. So it's really trying to do a high level overview of a lot of what's going into the principles of the MRI, uh, particularly with regards to the physics. <clears throat> And then as the course uh, goes on and these lectures continue, we'll end up digging into a lot of these topics in more uh, uh, detail. And so this lecture is designed to give you the framework and some basic idea of how an MRI system is going to work. Um, so the first thing we need to understand what's going to be happening is uh, coming from the concept of electromagnetic waves and fields. Okay. Um, and these are invisible waves of electric and magnetic fields and that are propagating. So this is the wave part of it all around us at all times. Um, so these include you know, x-ray, visible light, microwaves, radio waves, um, many sources of this electromagnetic radiation as it's often called, uh, used in all communication systems, radio, Wi-Fi, etc. Right. Um, maybe just for, unless we're talking face to face, in which case it's a pressure wave uh, that's performing the communication. <clears throat> and in the electromagnetic waves, uh, this picture up here is showing the uh, electric field E, the magnetic field B, um, and then C on this axis is the propagation factor. So in the case of a vacuum that is propagating at <clears throat> the speed of light in space, um, but this will change if it's propagating in different medium. And then um, the, these components are nine, perpendicular 90 degrees out of phase. And for MRI, we mostly are going to be focusing on the B component, the magnetic component. It is magnetic resonance imaging after all, um, but a little bit uh, understanding the electric field component, particularly when talking about our uh, radio frequency coils that we receive signal with. So one of the key things we want to understand that happens in electromagnetic waves is, as you can see, they have a characteristic frequency, right? They have this characteristic oscillation you saw on the last slide. Um, and the concept of frequency is going to come up a lot in MRI. Um, and here's the a sort of larger look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, I mentioned uh, electromagnetic waves incorporate uh, radio waves. You see on one side on the lower frequency end here. Um, then we get up into you know AM, FM radio, kind of mixed in there around uh, FM radio is the frequencies that we're going to see in most magnetic resonance imaging systems, 3 tesla and 1.5 tesla, terms we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, a little bit lower frequency than some of our uh, other communications standards like Wi-Fi cell. There's These are kind of split up. Uh, there's different uh, showing some characteristic bands. Um, then we get up, for example, to, to visible light here. And then some of the other medical imaging modalities that use high energy uh, electromagnetic radiation like CT and PET, so commuted topography, positron emission topography, exist in this much higher uh, frequency uh, range here than we're working with with MRI. Um, and one point uh, I want to make about 
this radiation is that we have a characteristic wavelength that's associated with any sort of electromagnetic waves. Uh, it's proportional to the propagation speed. So again, the speed, which is C, the speed of light in the vacuum, divided by the frequency. Um, and the frequency is that we're dealing with an MRI, a couple of them listed down here for our typical types of MRI systems, our 64, 128 megahertz, for example. And as shown in this drawing, this illustrates this wavelength at of electromagnetic waves at this frequency. And we see that, you know, compared to typical human body sizes, these wavelengths are about as big as the body or, you know, a little less. And, and actually this is um, one thing with MRI that means our electromagnetic waves can really easily propagate throughout and exist throughout the entire uh, subject. So we can get you know, good non-invasive imaging across an entire cross section at a time. Uh, which is different for something like optical imaging. So if you recall from the last slide, optical imaging has a higher frequency, so it has a shorter wavelength, <clears throat> and so it doesn't uh, go through the tissue as far, and, and similarly for ultrasound as well. So you have uh, issues of penetration depth in those modalities that we do not have in MRI. Now another... Uh, consideration, I'm bringing this up to, to make a point in comparison, particularly to other imaging modalities, is that the energy of an electromagnetic wave is directly proportional to the frequency. So as you can see uh, in this chart uh, down here, uh, uh, we can have very, <clears throat> the, the RF energies are actually quite uh, low compared to particularly noting X-ray. And this is the reason why in MRI, the radio frequency range of energies that we use, they're non-destructive, they're non-ionizing. Um, when you go up to X-ray based imaging modalities, so X-ray computed tomography, and this also includes positron emission tomography or PET, um, you get to uh, energy levels that can be destructive uh, two tissues, so we you know use those with a little bit more care in terms of considering the dose. Um, and um, in MRI, we do not have that type of ionizing radiation, so that's going to cause DNA damage. Um, we do have limits and safety in MRI on the total amount of RF energy used, as we'll see later. We're going to be depositing some energy at the MRI radio frequencies in around 100 megahertz, and at some point. You know, you can uh, you can sort of make a you know uh, a microwave if you really dump enough of this energy into a subject. So there's a limit in terms of how much energy we're going to do. If if you put in too much of this energy, your subject will get a little warm, and you know there's we, there's some potential risks there. Um, so there are safety limits called the specific absorption rate or SAR associated with MRI RF energy. Okay, so we have our electromagnetic waves. We're going to come back to that. We're going to see where these frequencies come from in MRI. Um, and to um, now we need to step back and look at this concept of spin. And this is really fundamental to MRI. That's why we're bringing this up right at the beginning here, because this concept of spin is where actually what creates the signal in MRI. And um, we will go over in this lecture, you know, the, the basics of what spin is to really understand spin in great depth. It's very much a quantum, uh, there, there's quantum mechanics explanations that are not in fact necessary for understanding uh, MRI. Um, so we'll sort of go into this concept of spin at the level of depth that's being covered uh, in the textbook and this in the lecture here. Okay, so spin, the official definition here, an atom with a non-zero nuclear angular momentum resulting in a magnetic moment mu. So what, let's unpack that statement. What does that mean? 
<clears throat> so the main component here is that we have actually what is a spinning charge particle. So we have an atom and uh, hydrogen, which has a single proton in the nucleus, is one of these atoms. And actually, that's the one we image for MRI. <clears throat> um, the charge, uh, the the uh, the proton there in the hydrogen atom will actually be spinning around. Okay, and if we have a charge, one of the things we can get from electromagnetics is if we have a charge that's moving, it's going to create a magnetic field. And there's in this drawing you see the movement of the spinning particle going around. And there's actually a right hand rule phenomenon here. Um, and so if the charge is spinning in one way, you'll get a magnetic moment pointing in the other direction here. So that's the right hand rule. <laughs> get my hand correctly here. So if we have you know, charge moving in one way, we'll get a magnetic field going in the other direction. Okay, so now we're starting to get a magnetic component here. And this is a little bit where the electromagnetism comes in. Um, okay, so I'll get back in a second to what this magnetic moment is, what that means for our spin and when we're talking about spin in, in MRI in human MRI really what we're talking about is hydrogen atoms or often we refer to them as protons because it's a single proton that gives rise to this spin property and this happens to work very well for imaging because 80 percent of the atoms in our body are protons uh, there are a bunch of other isotopes we can definitely image carbon 13 fluorine 19 sodium 23 phosphorus 31 many more. Um, these are typically less abundant, so there are less number of atoms, as well as these specific isotopes are also often less common. Um, so there's much less signal if we try to image other spins with MRI. And fundamentally, these spins, so the protons or hydrogen atoms, are going to be what giving our signal in MRI. Okay, so um, now, doing magnetic resonance imaging, what's, what's the deal with the magnetic part here? Um, okay, so we have this interpretation of a spinning charged particle. It creates a little magnetic field. So we can think of these little atoms as kind of like little uh, magnets. And so they're little, little magnets that are existing throughout your body, every uh, hydrogen atom in the water in your body. Uh, for example, one of the most common thing we're imaging is those hydrogen atoms. They're created, they're these little magnets. Um, and one of the key properties of the magnetic field that they create is this down here, the gyromagnetic ratio or gamma. Um, it's specific to the different uh, isotopes. <clears throat> um, we're basically using one, so we'll use one gyromagnetic ratio there. But that's a, a term, uh, a constant that's going to come up in a number of our equations going forward here. Okay, so we have our hydrogen atoms are these little magnets, and then we're going to let's start to figure out what happens when we put those hydrogen atoms in a magnetic field, because that's uh, and that's what, how we're going to do MRI is we're going to put a person inside a big magnet and try to create an image through their body. Uh, one concept that's going to keep coming up in discussing MRI is this concept of magnetic susceptibility. So what is this? Magnetic susceptibility is a measure of how magnetized a substance gets when it's placed in the magnetic field. And when I'm talking about magnetic susceptibility, I'll often abbreviate with the signal uh, chi here. Uh, which is uh, the, yeah, the notation used for magnetic susceptibility. And what the magnetic susceptibility means is an, it's a property of a substance. For example, uh, tissue, you can see a couple examples here, uh, calcium, oxygen. Um, let me move myself over here for a sec. Uh, gadolinium, iron. Um, and different substances will actually get oriented or create magnetic fields that are either parallel to the bank to, to an external magnetic field or anti-parallel. 
So every magnetic field like, has a direction to it. And the magnetic fields we use in MRI are sort of typically this one directional magnetic field going down the length of the tube of our uh, MRI system. And these diamagnetic compounds and create a magnetic field that's absolutely in the opposite direction to that main magnetic field that we're applying. Uh, so this is the majority of our tissues. Paramagnetic compounds, gadolinium, iron, oxygen, a couple of things we'll use for contrast, will be in the opposite direction, uh, aligned with the field. And then often when you think of something that's magnetic, you're not necessarily thinking of your body, like uh, I'm not magnetic, right? Your water or tissue. It turns out, you know, you have a, uh, you have this uh, uh, magnetism, um, this uh, magnetic susceptibility. So you're, you're mostly diamagnetic. When we often think about a, mag uh, some, a material that's uh, magnetic, we're thinking of something that's ferromagnetic, like iron, you know, like your, uh, like an iron wrench or something that's, or, or a paperclip that's going to be attracted to, you know, your bar magnet, right? And these are actually not what we're gonna, we actually don't want anything that's strongly ferromagnetic in an MRI system. It's actually gonna be, uh, as you might imagine, we have a, we're gonna have a big MRI magnet. If we take something that is uh, ferrous, that means it's ferromagnetic, it's gonna be attracted into that magnet and cause problems. So we're not gonna, or we don't wanna do ferromagnetic MRI. We're gonna be looking at mostly diamagnetic and paramagnetic compounds. And these, um, so now we have a big magnetic field. We got our substance in there and it'll create little changes. That's what these bumps in the line illustrate. There'd be little local changes in the magnetic field. Um, and the differences in magnetic susceptibility, as we'll see uh, later on, um, are actually used for contrast. So we're mostly diamagnetic. Oxygen is slightly paramagnetic. Iron is very paramagnetic. Metallic implants will be paramagnetic, uh, not ferro ferromagnetic. Uh, otherwise, we couldn't bring people in with them. But there are most metallic implants in the body are MRI compatible now. And then also see uh, I've added air in here, and air is kind of in the uh, in, in the middle here, slightly paramagnetic, I believe. And and so the air in your body is actually going to change the signal a little bit too. And we'll dig into this more later, just not putting that out here right now. Okay, so we've got a few uh, key ingredients here now. We have our electromagnetic waves that have some frequency. We have our spins, our hydrogen atoms in our body that we're going to try to get signal from. And then you have this concept of, of magnetic susceptibility. There's going to be some interaction between the tissue in our bodies and the magnetic field. So uh, the bulk of the rest that we're going to cover in this uh, lecture is how to um, perform magnetic resonance imaging. And I like to break this down into you know, just going by the, uh, the term here. So MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Let's break it down into three terms or magnetic part a resonance part, and an imaging part. Uh, the magnetic part, and we'll go into detail in each of these, is we're measuring magnetic properties of tissue, and I also need a large magnet. The resonance, what I'm referring to by resonance, means something happening at a uh, characteristic uh, frequency that is, that is synchronized. And what will Describe here is that we're measuring a concept product, uh, a phenomenon in the spins. It is a resonance phenomenon. And so uh, there's a special frequency at which actually these spins are moving around in a magnetic field. And if we apply some free, that same frequency uh, through <clears throat> the MRI system, then through the magic happens and we get signals. <clears throat> and then once we have signals, from the image uh, protons in our body, we're gonna we need to somehow create an imaging uh, an image out of that, um, and and we're gonna do this by actually making slight changes to the magnetic field and using Fourier transforms. So a lot in here. Let's go through and and try to again unpack each part of this. Um, the other way we can uh, divide up 
the basic MRI experiment or MRI imaging procedure is in these three steps. <clears throat> and the first step relates to the magnetic component of MRI. It's called polarization. So we're going to apply a large external magnetic field, typically denoted B0 or B0. You can see that over and over. Uh, once we've got our subject in our large magnet, we apply an excitation radio frequency waves. So these are electromagnetic waves applied at a very specific frequency that interact with the spins in your body. And then actually some of what happens is we're going to put in a little bit of this energy into the body because of this interaction at the right resonance frequency. Some of this energy is actually going to come back out and we can detect that to create images. So we're going to detect again some radio frequency waves that are emitted in fact by the spins in the body. And here's the, the illustration of what a few different MRI systems look like. Um, some, uh, so the units here we're going to see a lot are Tesla. That's the T3 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla. These are the most common uh, imaging systems. Seven Tesla is more of a that's sort of a very high end. It's our highest uh, magnetic field strength commercially available for human imaging. There's research doing 10 Tesla and higher, uh, some crazy stuff. Um, and, and these are what these systems are, look like. And hopefully you'll have a chance to, to get up and close and interact with some of these systems. So what's inside? Okay, so it's, um, if we took the picture of that MRI and we cut it open, what is the main stuff that's in there? Um, and we're going to go through each of these parts, uh, specifically the radio frequency coil, the gradient coil, the magnet, uh, the scanner, just means this is all the stuff put together, so that's, uh, we won't go in detail on that. Uh, the patient, uh, kind of crucial for MRI, so we won't worry about that too much. And then, of course, the table to move them in and out. So we're going to focus on these uh, radio frequency coil, gradient coil, and magnet, the main parts of the MRI hardware that we need. So let's start off by looking at magnet, the magnetic part of, the, the one big part of the magnetic part of magnetic resonance imaging, or B0. And what we call B0 is we call this actually our polarizing magnet. It's a large magnetic field measured in Tesla. Sig and in fact, the signal we're going to measure is proportional to the size of the magnetic field. So that's why you see these bigger and bigger uh, Tesla units on the MRI systems. Uh, there's physical limits. It's very hard to get above you know, three or seven Tesla requires quite big magnets, um, a lot of energy. So three Tesla is kind of the, the most common uh, high-end system now. And this magnet is also needs to be homogeneous. So that means it is pretty, it pretty much creates the same across the whole subject here. We want the magnetic field that would exist to basically be the same. <clears throat> uh, the, the units that this homogeneity is characterized in our parts per million or ppm <clears throat> and across the fov or field of view so that might be looking at you know we only need to look across and we're typically imaging within just the middle of the magnet and we want the field to vary as one part per million so that's one out of one part per million here this equals one out of one million. And MRI systems are typically using superconducting magnets, which provide these very large magnetic fields, also these very homogeneous and stable magnetic fields as well. So this is not your uh, refrigerator magnet. These, uh, a bar magnet, here is your refrigerator magnet, and, and a little more details about the magnetic fields. You know, they're 
Tesla is the big unit. Uh, Gauss is a smaller unit of magnetic field. Um, and in fact, the Earth, uh, uh, due to the composition, has its own magnetic field. This is how your compass works. And the field uh, around here is maybe around half a Gauss in a lot of places. Um, but this varies throughout the world uh, depending on the composition of the Earth under you and also where you are, uh, particularly north-south. <clears throat> um, this is where sometimes I refer to the magnetic north pole versus the real north pole. That depends on the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, your typical refrigerator magnet is on the order of 10 Gauss, so not quite up, so 100 times weaker than the magnets we're using for MRI. Um, and the magnetic field can be created in, in a number of different ways. The most, um, so most way that most people are familiar with is this bar magnet, right? Your, your ferromagnetic comp, uh, uh, material that has a, always has a magnetic field, but most of the ways in MRI, we're going to work with magnetic fields are by having electric currents pass through wires. Or we're going to have, like I showed earlier, the, the illustration of the spin. It's also creating a small magnetic field. So uh, we're, we're not dealing with the typical sort of uh, permanent uh, magnets you might think of. Okay, so have some background on, we've got this big magnet and we call it the polarizing magnet. So what does polarizing polarization mean? Uh, so that's what I'm going to walk through here. So what this illustration is showing in the absence of a magnetic field, so B being our magnetic field is equal to zero. If you looked at the spin, so all of our hydrogen atoms in the body, they're basically going to be pointing in random directions. Um, and uh, because of that pointing in the random directions, uh, if we... It, and this is, remember, these are uh, individual atoms. And we're not looking at the scale of MRI. It's not at individual atoms. It's much larger, you know, millimeters. Um, so we're looking over larger regions than single atoms. So we have to look at this concept called the net magnetization. And that's basically the sum of these individual spins over some volume. And if they're all pointed totally random directions, then I hope I can convince you that if you sum these together, they're totally disorganized. And so you're gonna see basically nothing if you look over some region. They're all different random directions. But the purpose of our polarizing magnet, oh, sorry. And then <clears throat> here's an illustration of that. If I take each of these spins, plot them from the center of the same axis and point them in different directions. So these arrows represent the individual spins within some region. Uh, pointing in totally random directions. Now, some of the magic starts to happen when we actually turn on or put our subject into a magnetic field. So we have now a B naught, an external magnet field that is non-zero. <clears throat> and what happens is there's a slight preference of these spins to be aligned uh, with or in the same direction or in the opposite direction as the magnetic field. Um, so if we look at then the, the sum of our individual spins over some region, now more of them are gonna be pointing in this illustration slightly in the direction of the magnetic field you can see that there's a little bit of, you know, just a slight clustering of the spins towards the same direction as the magnetic field. Then what this arrow sticking out of the top here represents is uh, uh, the net magnetization. And we often refer to this vector as M, for the net magnetization. So this is, again, is the sum of these spins over some region. Um, now I should note this is a slight preference. Okay, the the it's not it's not like you go in a magnet and, and all of a sudden all your spins point in the same direction as the magnetic field. 
they just kind of have a slight preference and it's 0.001% at three Tesla. Okay, so actually the number of uh, atoms that are actually creating the images in MRI is rather small, but fortunately there's so many of them and we can get pretty high magnetic fields that we can create uh, nice images here. Uh, I'll you see an axis convention I put on this slide now. Uh, convention is usually that the main, main polarizing magnetic field is along the z-axis. And this is the notation we'll use throughout this course. Okay, so we have our net magnetization, which is a vector pointing uh, in the <clears throat> z direction, pointing in the same direction as the main magnetic field. And how much this, uh, how much of this alignment there is, so how much net magnetization we have, we can calculate from an equation like this. It's m naught or m zero here. It's called the equilibrium magnetization. Uh, I'm not going to go through too much of the details of this equation. Just to want you to have that. A um, couple of things though to point out: uh, gyromagnetic ratio. As I mentioned before, determines the frequency. That's kind of a, a, a fundamental concept in magnetic resonance. We have uh, actually the number of these spins. So then stands to reason the more spins we have in a region, uh, and they're all going to have the, they're all going to have the slight preference that the more spins you've got, the larger this net magnetization is going to be. Uh, a, couple, a lot of this other stuff we'd have no control over. Planck's constant, no control. Net spin, no control. Boltzmann constant, no control. Absolute temperature, we're not going to be freezing people uh, in an MRI system anytime soon. Uh, so no control over that as well. Okay. Um, and the signal we're going to get is going to be proportional to this net magnetization. So that's why if we have more spins or we have a larger magnetic field, B naught here, uh, either one of these, these are the ways we're going to get actually increased, uh, mostly C to get increased signal. Um, and that N term, I often refer to that as the spin or proton density. So how much spins we have per our mobile protons, these hydrogen atoms we have per unit volume. And in the air, there are, you know, there's water vapor in the air. So there is some, but it's very low um, concentrations, very low density. So we don't see any MRI signal from uh, the air. Um, so here's a couple of uh, axial images cut through the head like this. Um, air has no signal, so it's black out here. Uh, our soft tissues. So in the center here of the brain, most of your brain has a, has a similar proton density. You can see there is some, some variation across the tissue types, a little bit lower in the white matter. Um, you can also see signal on outside of the brain, so from skull, muscle, subcutaneous fat. Um, and uh, there, this is one of the ways actually we can look at MRIs, we can image this proton density. There are other types of MRI contrast we'll cover in a couple of lectures, such as this T1 weighted MRI. Um, and, and this is one of the, the things that's very powerful about MRI is you can get these different contrasts. So I show the T1 weighted image there. And this um, is going to come up right here in this, this introduction to MRI in this T1 is a time constant that we're going to see a lot in MRI. And this time constant comes into play when we try to answer the question, well, what happens when we go into a magnetic field? So what I said in the previous slides is we're outside of a magnetic field. We have no net magnetization. Okay, our spins are just pointing in all directions. We go into the magnetic field, and now they're going to slightly align with the magnetic field. This is not a instantaneous process. There's some time constant associated with this. So when we put our material, our subject into the magnetic field, there's this uh, uh, equilibration time and the time constant is T1. 
by which you go from totally random to slightly aligned with the magnetic field. It turns out this is uh, described simply by this uh, exponential function. Um, and we're going to come back to this equation quite a bit more when we get into particularly uh, image contrast. Very important concept. Okay, so what you're going to visualize here is the evolution of this net magnetization vector, which is the white here. And I'm often going to use this type of visualization of both our net magnetization because the way this net magnetization moves around is gonna is really crucial to understanding uh, MRI um, and the way it changes over time. So the first concept we can illustrate here is how the net magnetization here uh, goes from again starting off at nothing outside of the main magnetic field to being some of some amplitude that we can are going to image later on when it's inside. And this uh, movie is going to illustrate that, so let's just take a look at that. Okay, so you can see that this has this sort of uh, exponent, and this is described by this exponential relationship that I showed on the previous slide. So we start <clears throat> with zero net magnetization here, and then growing up to some value along the z-axis here um, and you see a little bit of flickering of b1 uh, that's kind of an artifact of this the simulation program that i used to to create this we'll discuss more what b1 means uh, so far we've just talked about b0 our main polarizing magnetic okay so we have that basically covers our m of mri magnet right we got a big magnet and we create this slight preference of our spins which have this magnetic property to orient with the main magnetic field now the r the resonance part of mri is kind of where there's a bit of uh, uh, magic in some respects um, this can be a, a tricky concept so uh, i'll try to cover it here i'll also do a, there's some good demos actually through this website here uh, that i'll go through in class time and the resonance and precession is the other term that I will use. Um, so what, the, what does this mean? In the presence of a magnetic field, now B naught, our spins, in addition to slightly aligning with the magnetic field, will also rotate around <clears throat> the uh, direction of the main magnetic field. Uh, so you can see these spins in this picture are always rotating around the z direction here the direction of the main magnetic field and they do this at a very specific frequency that depends on what the magnetic field is we call this the larmor frequency or the resonance frequency and it's equal to the gyromagnetic ratio gamma times the amplitude of the magnetic field and so now, earlier I showed what frequencies MRI operated at. Now we can actually calculate some of these frequencies by knowing a gyromagnetic ratio uh, and the main magnetic field strengths. Um, and so uh, this leads to our proton or hydrogen resonance frequencies of 64 megahertz at 1.5 Tesla, 120 mega, 8 megahertz at 3 Tesla. And these are in the so-called radio frequency range of electromagnetic waves. Um, and one point to make out that shows in this illustration is the individual spins, whatever direction they're pointing, will precess. Uh, and it's actually an analogy is kind of like a spinning top. They'll precess at this rate around the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, and so does the net magnetization. So the sum of these spins, and so they're all um, moving at the same rate. Now, initially. Um, since our net magnetization is pointed in the same direction as the magnetic field, and that's at the beginning of this animation you're seeing here, there's no rotation of the net magnetization. Now, in just a sec, when it hits it with this uh, yellow orange um, graphic there, that's illustrating the concept of excitation or RF pulse, which actually allows us to move around or manipulate this 
net magnetization becomes very important more later. And here again, I'm going to put in a uh, uh, this type of uh, illustration of the net magnetization M here, rotating, and now we're assuming again the z-axis is the direction of the magnetic field. So M that's slightly misaligned is going to rotate around the direction of the, uh, the main z-axis, like so. And again, it's going to do it at this characteristic lower more frequency. Okay. Um, you notice I don't have like T1 relaxation in here. Uh, eventually we'll get all these different phenomena unified together. But here I'm just showing the, the resonance or precession phenomena. Now, why is this resonance or precession so important? It's actually the movement of a magnet creates an electric current. So what I said earlier is that, well, in a spin, the movement of the electric uh, uh, electric field or electric charged particles create a magnetic field. Now we actually have the opposite principle also applies is that we have, if we have a movement of a magnetic field, so in this case, our net magnetization spinning around, this is gonna change the magnetic field, which is illustrated by this, uh, uh, the changes part of the magnetic field is illustrated by this yellow arrow here in a detector in what is going to be called our RF coil. So as the net magnetization rotates around, it changed, it's a, remember the net magnetization is like, has a magnetic field that it creates. So it's creating changing magnetic field as this magnetic field changes during precession, we can actually pick this up as an electric uh, current by placing uh, basically loops of wires around the body. So this gets us into the next major component. So we talked about basically the magnet or B0, right, which takes up the bulk of the real estate inside our MRI system, but now that gets us to our radio frequency coil. Okay, so here we're gonna show that same animation again of the net magnetization vector M. And when this magnetization vector is precessing or rotating, it's like a moving little magnet. So that it creates a changing or oscillating magnetic field. And one of the principles of uh, electromagnetism is that an oscillating magnetic field will create a uh, electric current in a simple loop of wire which we call a coil in MRI. Um, and then magnetic fields, turns out, are very hard to detect and measure, but electric currents, we know a lot about and can easily work with electric currents uh, <clears throat> to uh, measure uh, signals and manipulate signals. Okay, so once we have this, uh, so what we need now in our system, beyond our main magnet, is these RF coils, so these RF systems to uh, to interact with the spins or the net. So we have two types of RF coils, and this is coming from two places where we use radio frequency waves and MRI. The one that was shown on the previous slide is actually point two here. This is signal reception using receive coils, where the net magnetization is rotating at the resonance or Lorimer frequency, and we can create signals in these uh, loops of wire or RF coils uh, to, to detect this signal. Um, the other purpose of RF coils is we actually, before we can receive signal, we actually need to deposit some energy in the form of RF electromagnetic waves into our subject. And we need to also do this at the radio frequency, resonance frequency. Um, and this, as we'll, we'll learn shortly, perturbs the net magnetization from equilibrium, leads to this precession that then sends signal back out. So I sort of, I've color coded this picture here where green represents the RF energy from the transmit RF going into the subject. And then the orange here represents the energy, uh, electromagnetic energy coming back out that we need to um, pick up with our receive RF coils. And the green is being created by our transmit RF coils. 
So there's these are very different processes. Transmit system, sometimes abbreviated TX, it's very high powers, like tens of kilowatts. And we want this to be the same across our entire subject. So homogeneity is what we mean. Um, and usually it's done by a single large surrounding coil, typically what's called the body coil. I'll show some examples in a second of that. There's also a receive system. The receive system is now trying to detect these small currents in this millivolt range that arise from these uh, the net magnetization in the body. And since these are small signals, the most important thing is that these are very sensitive detect the small signals. And for that purpose, it turns out to be a better solution to create small loops and put them right on top of the subject, as we'll see some examples here in just a moment. And just remember, everything here is what's called tuned to the lawnmower frequency, so to operate at the specific radio uh, frequency uh, by the uh, electronics capacitors, inductors uh, in these uh, RF coils. So as this system is drawn here, it's sort of a simplistic view, what we would call um, where there's a one large radio frequency RF coil um, in the center of the magnet. And this is typically referred to as the body coil, which can be used for both transmit and receive. But the most common mode of operation is this is just actually a transmit coil. And then we'll have a separate set of receive coils. And so the transmit coil, if you took it out of the magnet, it would look something like this. It's called a uh, birdcage design, kind of from the way that it looks. And the key takeaway from that is it provides this very homogeneous magnetic field. And we're creating, as for reasons we'll discuss later, we're creating a magnetic field not in the z direction, which would be along the tube here, along the bore, but in the perpendicular direction. Now, receive coils are something you'll see very clearly when you go uh, observe or participate in an MRI exam. And these are coils, they're tailored to the anatomy of interest because of this requirement. They have to be, the point at the end here, they have to be high sensitivity. So we wanna put them as close as possible to whatever anatomy we're imaging. So you can see this example here of these head coils that are gonna be sort of wrapped around the head like a helmet. Um, show a couple other examples for a sec. And these consist of not just one big loop of wire, but a bunch of smaller loops of wire, uh, you know, on the orders of, of five or 10 or 20 centimeters in diameter. And there's a number of electrical requirements um, that I've listed here. Um, the main component, uh, point I, I want to make out of this is the fourth bullet there that, again, everything is done at this specific characteristic Larmor frequency. So all the hardware has to be created to operate at this uh, very specific frequency. And here's a few, there's a few examples of different uh, RF receive coils. Um, this is, you know, you can do a whole body imaging setup where they have something on the head, the chest, the pelvis, all the way down to the lower extremities. Um, uh, something on the shoulder here. And again, the, the key driving theme is putting these things as close as possible to the anatomy of interest. Um, and so they'll often be worn all over. Um, here's another uh, nice uh, example of, of a commercial head coil system with a very happy uh, MR subject there. Um, and of course, they have dedicated ones for like knees and hips as well. And um, briefly, what the key um, requirement for these coils, again, is what we often call the sensitivity. So that means how, uh, what, where they are gonna be able to pick up signals from. And it's just like a, a antenna, um, you know, used for uh, any other communication system, right? You go further away from your Wi-Fi router, you become less sensitive, would be the term to picking up signals. So you, your bandwidth is gonna go down, you know, you're gonna be watching this and it's gonna get all choppy. Um, you get closer to your router and then your bandwidths are gonna go up. You've got a better signal. It's, it's, it's analogous to uh, MRI here where we put our receive coils right up next to our subject. Uh, we're gonna get uh, brighter images, images with higher signal to noise or SNR. As we go further away, that signal drops off. And so we create images based on combining 
the Im images actually from different coils placed around uh, the body and, and again as close to the subject as possible. So keeping in mind that now we actually have both a transmit and a receive RF setup, this is my more realistic cartoon of the MRI cutout where this originally this this uh, larger piece that is right up in the edge of the bore of the tube is would be the body coil transmit RF and then placed uh, right on top of the subject or around the subject would be some sort of array coil for receive so an array RF coil for receiving the signal. Um, and summarizing a few of the key points, and we're, we're operating in the radio frequency or RF range around 100 megahertz. We'll talk more specifically about what the require, uh, what this field does. Um, and right now, the understanding one you have is what are all these different pieces you've got? And uh, remember, the transmit is basically depositing this energy into the body. The receive is then detecting the energy that's in some sense think of being reflected out um, from the body. Okay, the uh, last piece of the system that we need to cover are what are called, what we commonly and uh, what I will uh, refer to as the gradients, um, but here there did the gradient uh, coils. Okay, and we'll, um, these are important for the third uh, part of MRI, the imaging piece. So, and these are not, uh, in fact, a single coil. It's a set of three coils and optionally some sm few more where there's X coils, Y coils, and Z coils. And the purpose uh, of this is going to enable to us to create images uh, in any direction. Uh, so we can create you know, axial images, sagittal images, coronal images. We can even tilt the image in any direction. The X, Y, and Z components here allow us to fully manipulate the, the, the imaging setup in, in all three spatial dimensions. So how are we gonna use these to create images? Okay, so the what we've learned so far about um, creating images is that when our net magnetization uh, precesses or rotates at the Larmor frequency, we're going to be able to pick this up with our RF coils. But so far, all I've told you is that there is one frequency and that the frequency, uh, that frequency is the Larmor frequency. It's proportional to the strength of the main magnetic uh, field here. So, how um, are we going to um, disentangle uh, signals from various parts of the body, right? Our RF coil picks up, picks up all of it. It actually doesn't care too much where it comes from. So the solution here is really elegant. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look across our subject and we're gonna make the magnetic field slightly different, not a lot different, but uh, uh, one less than 1% different across the body. And now what's gonna happen is we still have this relationship that frequency is proportional to the magnetic field, but the magnetic field being high on one side versus on the other side, we're gonna have different frequencies coming from different parts of the body. And this is gonna enable us to do imaging. And the system that creates this difference magnetic field are called the magnetic field gradient coils, or again, gradients for short and they change the magnetic field as a function of position. So here's a cartoon to illustrate that, and we're gonna to start to add in a few more concrete components of um, the, our magnetic fields and uh, now our gradient coils, and we're gonna use this relationship that the resonance frequency, so the frequencies that we're getting in our signals are proportional to the magnetic field. Okay, so that's this relationship up here. So how I've set this up to start is that we've got our subject lying in our magnet. Um, we have our magnetic field points along the direction that our subject is lying. 
And what this plot at the bottom here is saying is that the magnetic field is the same everywhere along position in this setup. So this is going to be the situation that's not helpful. We can receive uh, uh, these signals. Um, but the way we're going to disentangle different positions is we're going to add the magnetic field gradient using these gradients or the gradient coils. And so that's illustrated at the top here by these additional arrows. So what the gradients do is they either add or subtract a little bit of magnetic field on top of the main B0 field. So on one side here, they're adding, they're pointing in the same direction on the right side here. On the left side, they're subtracting from that. In the center, they're not changing. So this gradient refers to a change uh, over some dimension. And this is the change here. Or we can visualize that in the plot at the bottom where now the magnetic field is changing, in this case, linearly as a function of the position once we have turned on the magnetic field gradient coils. So we put some uh, current into these coils. And now, um, and the precise relationship is shown over on the other side here, where the frequency here denoted by omega is going to be proportional to gamma times the magnetic field, which in this case is gamma times the magnet B naught, the main magnetic field times the GZ, and this is uh, what we commonly refer to as our gradient amplitude, um, and that's in the plot in the lower left here. That's just a, a function of position. Um, and it's changing the slope as a function of position. And then you have the z term here, so that tells us this is changing as a function of z. So now I'm going to go ahead and we've got our net magnetization vectors. And what's going to happen, because the magnetic field is different at the orange and the blue location, is that the net magnetization vectors are going to have different frequencies of rotation. So let me just go through and um, so this is what's going to allow us to uh, disentangle um, these two different locations as they're going to be rotating at different frequencies. And here note these net magnetization vectors before we were looking at them sort of in this view with z upright. Here we're looking straight down from the top. So just in the x, y plane, we're not looking at the z part to just look at the frequency of the rotation. Uh, now here's another example where I've flipped uh, the system sideways. So now the main magnetic field still pointing along the direction of the subject, just for the purposes of my plot here. It's like I've taken the MRI system and flipped it up. <laughs> um, makes it a little simpler. So again, we start with a condition where we only have the main magnetic field be not. We're going to turn on the magnetic field gradient. And now we're using the X gradient. So that's going to change the magnetic field in the, in the X or the left right direction in this picture by either on the right side, it is adding onto the main B0 field. On the left side, it is subtracting from the main B0 field. So we have this gradient of magnetic field as a function of position, but now since we're using a different gradient coil, we have it in a different direction. So if we're again to look at the signals or the net magnets that are going to arise from the net magnetization at different locations in now in the x direction, we're once again going to have a case where there's a different frequency of rotation between our different positions. And so this is fundamentally how we're encoding uh, information about different positions in MRI. We're going to, and uh, well, as we'll go through in the course, we can create an image by separating signals that have different frequencies.
So um, I'm going to show uh, this slide uh, several times throughout uh, this series of lectures over the quarter. Uh, so it's a, a, a pretty dense, but I wanted to uh, put some of this information out there now that we've gotten a flavor for the big picture of the magnetic, uh, the main components of an MRI system. And um, um, so we have, and, and we've started to discuss now a number of these, right? We have our main uh, magnetic field, B0. This is the biggest magnetic field. The purpose of that is to polarize the spins to create some alignment with the magnetic field. We have our magnetic field gradients or gradients that we just talked about. And these are two to three orders of magnitude smaller than the main field. Um, and then we'll turn these on and off sort of slowly, uh, frequency of one kilohertz. So that's about maybe up to every millisecond. And we're gonna use these to uh, actually for the imaging part to create images. We have our radio frequency coils, which create and detect uh, radio frequency fields, which we denote by this B1. These are perpendicular to the main field, so they're in X and Y as opposed to Z, for reasons when we'll cover this in more detail later. And these are even smaller than, these are magnetic fields are even smaller than, than our other main field or gradient coils. Um, but now they're operating at a much higher frequency, hundreds of megahertz, so this radio frequency range. And the purpose of them, of the radio frequency coils, is this excitation, is we put some radio frequency energy into subject and then reception, detecting some of the radio frequency that comes back out. Uh, and then we'll also talk more about the net magnetization, which is also a source of magnetic fields. It's oscillating at the Larmor frequency as well, but it's uh, even smaller. And so the small signal that we've got to pick up. So um, to, I wanted to wrap this up with this uh, exercise here. And I think this is a challenge uh, put forward to, to all of you to do um, is try to explain to your parents or your roommate, your friends, significant other, how MRI works. So they're going to say, oh, you're taking an MRI course. You should know how MRI works. Tell us how it works. Um, and I think MRI is the hardest of the medical imaging modalities to learn um, uh, because it's not as straight. I, I could, you could easily draw a picture of like an X-ray or an ultrasound. It's a lot easier to conceive of. MRI is a lot harder. So here's a first stab in this first lecture of how you could try to explain this uh, to to uh, to someone. So first point you got to make is remember that MRI, sig where does the MRI signal come from? It comes from hydrogen atoms, mostly in water molecules that are in your body. Okay, so that's what you're fundamentally imaging. Now, second point, well, this is magnetic resonance imaging. Part of that is that actually there's magnetic properties to every single hydrogen atom in your body. Um, and so uh, what happens when you go in a big magnet is actually these small uh, magnetic moments, the, the hydrogen atoms become slightly aligned with the main magnetic field. So we've got this slight alignment of all these hydrogen atoms and we use really big magnets because this creates a little bit stronger alignment of the hydrogen atoms makes them easier to see. So we've got hydrogen atoms in a mag big magnetic field that we're gonna look at. Now, how we actually look at them is we use radio frequency signals. So signals the same used as in, uh, in, in radios, uh, phones, um, Wi-Fi is a little higher frequency, but um, very similar you know, signals there. And so we send these frequencies into the body and some of them 
or actually uh, there, there's some amount of radio frequency energy that's sent back out. And how that uh, comes back out is the, is the signal that we measure and enables us to see get inside uh, the body in this way. Um, okay, so now we can get some measurement of, of the signals of the hydrogen atoms in your body. The final piece that is the imaging part is how are we gonna separate the signals coming from different parts of your body? And the main way that we do this is we actually create slight changes in the magnetic field that cause the frequencies of the energy to change in different positions in your body. So we have these two uh, magnetic fields. We have one really large magnetic field. It's the, coming from the big magnet that you're going inside. And then we create small perturbations on top of that that uh, mean that we can actually detect, uh, separate signals coming from different parts of the body. Okay, so that concludes uh, this lecture. Um, there's uh, just to, you know, my comment on this is that there's a lot of material in this lecture um, and we'll spend a bit of time going over this uh, in class as well. Um, you can use these questions, the learning goals to kind of guide uh, self-study or repeat viewing of this to try to answer these questions that uh, I've listed here on the slide. Um, and, and this will help reinforce some of the concepts uh, from this uh, lecture. Great, thank you very much for watching.